All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Construction Hall of Fame podcast. Today, we're in for an interesting episode and the start of an interesting series. We have Terry Patterson, who is the president of Patterson Project Management in Florida, where they build high-end custom homes, luxury residences. And long story short, this is a fun episode and series for me because this will be the first to kick off our series of high-end luxury home builders on the podcast. So thank you very much for joining us today, Terry. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So as always, I like to kick off the show by telling your story. Would you mind sharing with the audience how you got to where you are today as the president of Patterson Project Management? Sure. Um, well, I'm sure you can tell by my accent. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not from here originally. I'm from South, Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, came here in 1999. And my... You know, I jumped, I got right into construction very quickly. So I guess I'll go back a little bit in, in South Africa when I was growing up, we, we moved around a lot. I changed schools a lot and moved to different cities a lot for my father's job. And, uh, the plus side of that is it helped me, help me be able to learn how to make new friends and meet new people, uh, and get to know people from changing schools so often and, 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 uh, and cities. And, but my father and my parents would like to always buy the uh, oldest, dingiest house in the best neighborhood and uh, put the family to work to make something of it. So uh, I think back as a young kid and maybe, maybe, you know, I think that I did so much work in those houses, but in reality, I was probably just the sweeper and the picker upper of the tools but it at least exposed me to what, um, to, to construction as a, from a young age. By the time I was 20, living in Cape Town, um, I was making, I guess, too much money as a 20 year old running restaurants, uh, restaurants and bars to pay for my, uh, education. And a friend of mine convinced me to buy a couple of pieces of land. I don't know if I was a sucker or if I, uh, but I, I, I had the money and I, and I just did it and, and it was a couple of miles from the beach in Cape town. And then I hired an architect, hired a builder, didn't have enough money to pay the builder for all the work that he had to do. So I had to jump in and help as much as I could from building a couple of houses and built these houses and then rented them out and sold them. So that was all by the time I was, before I was. Oh, well, by the time I was 21, I'd finished those houses and I thought this was, this was great. I enjoyed it as a bit of a sidekick, but then by 23, I had an opportunity to move to the United States in 1999 and I jumped on it. February, 1999, moved here and well, actually I wasn't coming here to move here. I came here to, uh, for a three month vacation and then go back to South Africa, to be honest, to be honest. And while I was here, the. I noticed that uh, I felt that development, construction, real estate investment, and just the opportunities in the United States were way different to where I came from in South Africa. As much as I loved South Africa while living there, all I wanted to do was, I just wanted to just come here and visit and get back to my home country. But once I was living here, I thought, no, no, this is, this is the place to be, United States. And I picked up the phone, called a friend of mine who was a realtor and said, sell my houses, uh, sell my car. Um, I was actually about to buy a restaurant on the beach and I said, uh, get me out of that contract and I'm staying here in the United States. And immediately I had to start, start working and all I could do was get a job for $50 a day doing demolition. I had a funny accent and, uh, my education and my experience meant nothing to anybody here. So I had to start doing demolition and then I would just be a helper to a carpenter. And then finally, within about eight months, I was given a job uh, to help oversee the construction of a small luxury hotel and, uh, but hands on do a lot of the work myself, which I then did for the next year. And that hotel ended up being rated one of the top small luxury hotels in the country by the time we were done. I was then made to be the general manager of that hotel because as we're busy building it, uh, I think I have a 
a bit of a big mouth and I kept on commenting on the way things were being uh, implemented, the way it was being started. And I was finally, the owners just said, you know what, screw it, you just do it then. So I ran the place and what really helped me was I was starting my little construction company on the side and we, this hotel was amazing and everyone who would come and stay there and we were winning awards all over the place and everyone who would come and stay there would say to my staff, who did this construction? I'm buying a house here. Can you get me, can you, can you get hold of the, the general contractor for me? And the staff would just say, well, it's Terry, you, you, you see him every day. Um, and what I was doing was the owners eventually over there, let me, let me run it in the mornings until about one, two o'clock in the afternoons, I would, uh, run my construction company. And that's how it kind of boomed because all these people from the hotel moving down here, wanting to buy houses in 2000, 2001 and renovate them. Um, uh, they were just giving me work, giving me work because they could see what I had done in this, in this hotel. They, they saw how it was being run and, um, they saw the awards we were winning and they, you know, in the end we're in a service industry. So the hotel was like a service industry. Construction is a service industry as well. And when people in the construction industry might not think that it is, but it really is. So people would come in and just see the kind of service that they would get from myself, my staff, and uh, then see the work that we had done and then just not even ask questions, just give me the contracts to renovate their houses. And I would do that. I would start in the 50, 60, 100,000, 200,000, $300,000 range. And uh, then just slowly just built that up over time and went, went really, really fast. And I, um, I then, what, what, what pushed me into the much bigger houses was once my, believe it or not, once my, uh, once my daughter started going to school. And in the schools, you just meet amazing people. And if uh, you, you, there's also that instant trust because you're doing so many things with the kids together at school and people would start giving me bigger contracts, 600, 700,000, uh, a $3 million contract I got. And I was this little kid and people trusting me. Um, it, was, it was amazing. So it was a very fast rise. And, and, I, and I, I put that... I feel like I rose so fast because I had that hotel that everyone could come in and see and experience the kind of service that they would get from me as a general contractor. And it just, there was that instant trust and everything about construction and hiring a general contractor is, is, is trust. You've got to have so much trust in this business. Um, and then you have to be able to back that up with service because you, you're dealing with people. Once you get that contract, you're dealing with people for years. Um, you know, renovation would be would be quick, but today we only build new construction. So you're dealing with people for two, three years. Um, you're you're in their homes, in their lives. Uh, you, you've got to be able to start with that, start with that trust, and then you have to follow through with that. Otherwise, you get uh, your real personality. They'll get to know who you are real fast. And things go bad if you don't just give them that service that they, they trusted you with from the beginning. So that's how, that's how I got into this, where I went from there. Um, you know, 2004, 2003, I'd say 2003, 4, 5, 2002, 3, 4, 5. There was, you know, there's a lot of people doing development. The interest rates were getting really low. By 2005, I think we were at our at our peak and uh, the owner of that hotel uh he was he was a realtor and he said to me hey let's 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 build townhouses he had already was already representing a big a big developer and then he finally said to me one day why don't you build i sell and uh he'll stop representing this other developer and that's exactly what we did we um got a bank to give us a I think that company was a $15 million line of credit and uh, we, um, he came up with a bunch of money and uh, we started building townhouses. Uh, within, within two years, we had 15 contracts and we're well underway with uh, luxury townhouses downtown Fort Lauderdale, some luxury homes downtown Fort Lauderdale, all new construction and uh, it was fantastic. I then started a couple other development companies on the side with a few other people that said, Hey, come, can you build this house for me? Can you do this development with me? It's another six unit development and another 
big house. And at this point, I was 27, 28, 29 years old, young kid, and, and I had $23.5 million in construction loans out there with a hell of a lot of money that we had put in. In, in, in equity, I had uh, about 18 different properties going, uh, which, and which, which was about 25, that's properties, but there's townhouses in those, so that when you add up, it was total, probably about 30 units all underway. On top of, at the time, was a renovation business that I had where I was doing big renovations for people. And this was all just as, this all was going fantastic and uh, until we got into the recession. That was 2008. And then obviously we all, we all came to a screeching halt. Um, my life, which seemed like it was going uh, absolutely perfect, everything just kind of imploded because I had so many developments underway. People were pulling out of contracts left, right, and center, telling me to keep keep the deposit money. Please keep that 10% I gave you. Um, just don't sue us to, to close. And I'm like, no, 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 I want you to close. I don't want your money. And it's, it's, but they wouldn't. So luckily for me, renovations at that point really started really I was still doing renovations and new construction and the renovations just carried on going fantastic that I could I could actually sell off all my all my properties that I had um, at a discounted rate that the banks allowed me to and then I was allowed to actually finish the construction of those properties but I had to take I had to take money that I was making as a general contractor uh, uh, renovating houses but, but doing a lot and use it to finish finish construction of these other units and then sell them for a discounted rate. But at least I managed to get through the recession. I managed to retain my key staff, which was the, which was very important for me, and maintain my banking relationships, which was very important with me. So that when we came out of the recession, which was, uh, you know, we know it was 2008, 2009, but the reality for developers is um, it started 2007 and for developers that came, we really only started coming out of it around 2013. But when I came out in 2013, I had all the relationships, all the staff. Um, I was building a, a number of houses already, new construction homes, big homes. At that point, I already had about seven or eight uh, um, awards under my belt from the city of Fort Lauderdale, uh, uh, first place community appearance awards from since 2002 to all the way to now, different awards. And I could start, I hit the ground running as we all came out of the recession where a lot of people had to ramp up and hire more staff and kind of get, get, get their name out there again. I was still out there and had big houses that I could show and big brand new houses on the New River, on the intercoastal things going up that it just it just skyrocketed from there. So today we average, uh, we're, we're building, today we build, we're building six to 10 new big waterfront homes at any given moment to plus, uh, normally got two or three or four in the pipeline that we're busy working on with uh, plans, designs, um, and, um, and then I also have developments that I would own. Right now, my big development is Lighthouse Point Yacht Club, uh, which is in Lighthouse Point, a 10 acre property in Marina with a commercial yacht club and 21 townhouses and a big single family home and everything on the water right, uh, right near Hillsborough Inlet. So that's, that's the genesis of how I got to where I am. Obviously, there's a hell of a lot in between that. But, um, yeah, that's, that's where I came from. That's, that's what got me to where I am today. Fascinating story and, and really so much to dive into, kind of rewinding to some points along your story that, that hit me with some questions. So going back to when you first started, 
and you came to the U.S. And, and you're starting to work with these people who, in your mind, didn't value your experience. Even if you had all this great experience, it was from different areas, different types of work. Maybe they, they just didn't see it as relevant as as you might even have thought it was at the time. A lot of people could have just folded and said, I, I, this is terrible. I can't work in the U.S. But obviously you weren't that type of person. You were persistent. So that's great. What do you think it was that made them at that I think it was less than a year shift in their perception of you to, to go from someone who is more working in the trenches on the labor side of things to someone they perceived as more of maybe an executive leader who they then went into CM, then it went into GM. They, they obviously saw an executive in you. Clearly, there's an entrepreneur inside of you. But what do you think it was that changed their perception of you in that process? Well, you know, you can't have the attitude that uh, I know all these things, so you need to trust me. You need to build trust. And that's with, that's with everything and anything in life. Um, even even today, that's my same attitude I have uh, for people. I can't just say, I built all these houses, so you need to trust me. No, I will build I will build that trust. And what I did back in 99 and 2000 is I, I just got down in the trenches. I dug those holes. I planted those trees. I cut that lumber. I hung those doors. I painted that room. I sanded that floor, I built that deck, I laid that block, I just, I did it all. And over and above that, I gave my opinion on what things should be, what they should look like. I showed them that I had um, design knowledge. I can give them different ideas, guide the people who would try this, try that. Um, and then as far as the business went, goes of that hotel, I had come from hospitality. Um, in fact, that's where I started in, in South Africa. Um, while working to pay for college, uh, I was running, I was working in restaurants since 15 years old. And actually I was working since 12 years old, I was working in flea markets to pay for my skateboarding, uh, my skateboarding habit. But um, by the time I was 15 and I could get a job in a restaurant, um, I rose very fast in those restaurants. By the time I was 17, I was manager of the restaurants. By the time I was 18, while studying uh, in college, I was I was put at, sent to management courses by the head office of a uh, restaurants that were had um, 380 stores throughout South Africa, and they were all 200 to four to 600 seat restaurants. The, the head office would send me to go do management training courses, and those courses, you know, those were my formative years. In your, in your late teens, and your early 20s, that's your formative years. The things that you learn um, in those years are some of the most important things that shape you and who you're going to be in life. And they sent me on these training courses, and then they sent me on these train-the-trainer courses. And I think those train-the-trainer courses um, set me up for who I am today because knowing how to teach somebody else how to teach somebody else is key. Knowing how to teach somebody else something is one thing. Now, knowing how to teach somebody to teach somebody is a whole other thing. And that is what construction is. I feel like that's what all business is. And they taught me how to do that, which then rose me up. By the time I was 19, 20, 20 years old, I was heading up a training store for the head office, teaching people, teaching these multimillionaires who had just spent millions of dollars of their life savings to buy these restaurants and to teach them how to run them and teach their staff how to run them and teach their staff how to train their managers how to train their other staff. And for me, that was, I did that at, at a very young age and it just, it, it sears in your memory, like all those things that you learned. And I just implemented that while I was here. I might be out there in the trenches, people not really trusting me from my initial Hi, my name is Terry Patterson. Trust me. Um, that didn't work, by the way. I tried that. Um, the, the Seeing me show up at 7 a.m. in the morning and work till 5, 6 in the evening and offer my comments, offer my assistance while we were, they were trying to build this, build this hotel. Um, I knew a hell of a lot about management software back then because coming from a corporate environment in a restaurant, uh, the, 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 the software was everything and I had to learn it. But when I was 19, I was using QuickBooks and I was, I was, I was doing food cost calculations and, and, and doing all these, all these, I was, I was, by the time I was 20, 
21, 22, I was programming restaurant management software in the restaurants, software that you would buy, but then if you don't program it correctly, um, the software won't work correctly. So I understand that garbage in is garbage out. So I implemented all of that into this hotel, sort of just giving them ideas. And then I would find the stuff. I said, here, just try this hotel software. Try this software. Try that. Yeah, look here. I've done some research on it. I just keep on offering some assistance without sounding like uh, I'm too pushy. And eventually they took note and I think got sick and tired of me being so persistent and just said, you know what? You do it. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. And I did it. And I feel like that's what got them to trust me. And then that hotel, the amount of awards that we won, thanks to the owners trusting me and thanks to the owners. And I learned from them because don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I'm the one that did all of that. I'm saying that I'm the one that helped them implement their vision and their vision was amazing. But in a way, that's kind of like what building a house is. I'm not the one making your house this most amazing house. What my job is to do is to implement your vision. Don't let you go into too many tangents, but it's not my vision that your house must end up being. This hotel that I built for these guys was their vision and they were amazing. And I just, I could just make their thoughts come to life. That's all. Um, so that's, that's for me was that stepping stone, but it was just work, 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 hard work, hard work, communicate, talk, um, be present. That's, that's what, that's what it was. That, that's what took me from being just the guy digging a trench and planting the trees and doing some work to being recognized and giving all these opportunities. You know, it's, it's not my saying that everybody knows is, you know, success is, is a bit of luck, but it's not really what it is, is, is the opportunities are given to you and do you take them? Do you roll with them? And I feel like I can recognize opportunities or sometimes you don't, but you, but sometimes you don't know if they're the best opportunity, but you try everything. And that's the other thing I do is I will, I will try everything and I will work hard and then a few things are going to stick. And then as long as you're constantly working and moving forward, people are going to pick up on it and, and, and just want more from you. And then you need to give more, give more, give more than, give more than what people are paying you to do. That is one of the other keys. Like you give, you always, if I, I never want to, I've always, when I was younger and, and now I believe that someone, everything is a transaction in life. Someone's paying me to build their house. Someone's paying me to, to work for their model. You, if you're paying me to do something, I feel that I need to give you more than what you are paying me for, not the other way around. And I feel like too many people in life, it is you pay me X, I do X. That's wrong. You pay me X, I must do X plus Y. And that gets you recognized. And then you become sought after the people want you and want to give you more work. And then, then you slowly can work, build yourself up. Not, well, I know I'm worth this, so you need to pay me that. No, just get me a little bit more. You build yourself up slowly but surely. Build yourself up, build yourself up. And build up your portfolio. That's what it was. Just hard work, giving more than what people were giving me. And I firmly believe that even today, if I'm not giving somebody more than what they're giving me, I, I feel uncomfortable. It sounds like a true achiever pattern to me. It sounds like you've been in some respects, a top performer at all aspects of your life or else the leaders who you were working with when you were 17 years old, probably wouldn't have put you in these development programs and seen this potential in you when they did. So it seems like really your whole life, you've been showing up, you've been willing to do the hard work and be consistent with putting in the hard work. You've wanted to add value. You've had a service minded approach to how you approach relationships and that's paid off in referrals in some senses, people referring you to this opportunity and then seeing the value in you in another opportunity. And that leads to growth path, which leads to other opportunities. And it seems like it's interesting because this does lead me into another point I'm, I was curious about when I'm just unpacking how your growth path went into running your own company. The, the high end, very high end residential space 
I found that it's different from many spaces in the construction world because it's so tight knit. It's so relationship based when it comes to building these big homes for these ultra wealthy individuals. It takes relationships a lot of the time to break in. It's often not as simple as putting up a nice website, running Google ads or Facebook ads or, you know, doing some marketing that you can pay a consultant to bring on. It takes relationships and it takes networking and it takes reputation oftentimes to get in these tight knit communities that are hard to break into. So for me, business development is something my clients in the high end residential space are often concerned with. And a lot of them, they get most of their business from referrals because historically they've done great work. They've built a great reputation. And a lot of their work does come from that community and that, that relationship networking aspect of the business. Others are wondering, how can I take my business to the next level? I have a great network of referrals, but I want to add something more intentional to the business, like maybe intentional outbound or intentional networking or meeting with architects and engineers in their networks to build up that relationship base and increase their ability to win more projects. For you, it sounds kind of like your storyline your whole life. It's you, you're, you're earning opportunities to impress someone or impress a situation, and that leads to you getting more business. The hotel led to renovations. The renovations led to more new builds. Would you say that most of your business development in your world is really relationships and execution and then getting word of mouth referrals? Or is there any intentional BD or business development in there? Or what does that look like for, for your firm? So that's 100% correct. So I explained this to my son who's uh, 20 years old studying construction management and um, wants to uh, bootstrap it and do it himself because he says, well, dad, you did it. I can, I can do it. Let me show you. I can do it. And I want to try and impress on him that um, it's very hard to get to the level that I am at now where our smallest contracts are $4 million contracts for a, a build to we have 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 million dollar build contracts. But you don't just get there through through Google ads and marketing and stuff like that. You never you can never do that. It takes time. You gotta start here, you gotta build an amazing, do an amazing half a million dollar job, or doing multiple, like I would be doing ten at a time. Do a whole lot of jobs at this level then do a whole lot of job that then gets you to the $700,000 level, which then gets you to the $900,000 level for the next job. But it takes you a year or two to finish all these jobs that you can now show new clients uh, the what you've done and then get them to trust you with a million dollar job. And then you've got to go through years of finishing those kind of jobs before you can show clients, well, now you need to trust me with a $1.4 million job and so on and so on and so on. So it takes... I mean, I'm 25 years in um, 2001, I started my business here, but really 25 years in, in the United States, just building this up. I could never just walk into a place 20 years ago and go, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Uh, give me your $10 million contract. I would never know how to manage that contract. Doesn't matter how good I, can, I th think I can build. Uh, because as you start getting into bigger contracts, the management of those contracts becomes a thing just on its own. Never mind the management of the actual construction. There's two totally separate things going on here, construction and managing massive contracts. So as you're building this up, as I said before, give people more get than what they're giving you. So they want to refer you. They want to give you more work. I've got people I've built three houses for. Um, there's build up that trust. There's nothing more important than a, a, a general contractor's and a developer's reputation. We can make more money. I can lose money on something, no problem. You, you could, if, if I've got to walk away from something, because, not walk away, but walk, walk away from the deal and have lost money or lost at the end or whatever, so be it. My reputation is the most important thing. It has to stay intact. Because a builder's reputation and a developer's reputation can get destroyed in a second. Our names, and I'm used to this from a very young age, and since back in 2002 when I started, uh, when I was, because uh, I was, you tend to, when you're small, you, you tend to be working in one confined area a lot. So people in that area start to get to know your name. And, and, I, and I'm used to it where... The Patterson Project Management or the Patterson name, and my kids would hear the, our name at school, 
And the last thing you want to do is hear that name get dragged through the mud because um, I was too proud to admit I was wrong or too proud because I knew I was right and I had to prove my point to that client and there's no way I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, whatever they want. Just eat your pride sometimes, do the work, do more than what's required of you, uh, have, keep your reputation high above anything. It's more important than money. That is advice I can give anybody. There's so many things I could have done and made more money that um, would have ruined my future. Just reputation, reputation, reputation. So important. I can't figure out if I answered your question there. <laughs> so similar to recruiting, how reputation is everything. It can be maybe alluring for some people to make a quick buck and maybe make a transaction not go as everyone would have liked to see it go. And it's a lot better for recruiters in the long run. Even when I talk to people who have been 30 plus year career recruiters, just to do the right thing in all cases, because ultimately what I've found is you make more money when you do the right thing. And I mean, historically I've prided myself on not doing the wrong thing. So I don't, for me, know the flip side of like trying to do bad transactions and recruiting. My job, yeah. ever, I believe you're only as good as your last deal in recruiting and you're only as good as your last placement. So for me, keeping that, that, that ethical code high is very important, but it sounds like you hold that similar. And really a lot of the yeah. people who I've talked to who are the best in these type of service-based businesses just talk about doing the right thing because ultimately you start with the truth because you usually end up there anyways. So if you just start with the truth and you follow through with that, to your point earlier, you have to follow through. You can't just build trust. You have to continue to execute and continue to build that trust because it can be lost. But it is an interesting point you made there. And something else that I want to dive into that was pretty interesting is you said you kept all your key staff in the 08 recession. Another interesting thing is you were able to go through that recession and you came out on the other side better. Interestingly enough, I, I heard this quote recently. It's like sometimes in business, all you need to do is last longer than the competition. It's like you don't need to necessarily do anything that much better. You just got to last longer than the other people. Right. And so in this case, it's like so many builders or GCs in the space maybe went down in 08 or they lost all their clients and they weren't able to recover. But you, on the other hand, you were there on the flip side. Your name was everywhere because you were still able to do work. You were keeping the business going. And like you said, even if it wasn't about making money, there was still your name in the community for deals that maybe didn't go ideally, right? Like they maybe pulled out or whatever it was. So you were still there. And on the flip side, maybe some would argue part of the reason that you were able to get so much business after is because you were there and you had that brand reputation that stayed in the market. You were able to hit it big. So basically that's phenomenal. And I'm wondering what did you do internally during that time period to make sure that you retained all your key staff? Keeping my key staff and getting those key staff that would normally be doing uh, some sort of a supervisory role or a management role to also understand that they got to use their hands and get down and get dirty just so we can get through those those couple of years of bad time and 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 they did it they all did it and today i'm sitting with people that have been working for me for jessica 19 years rigo 24 years uh, 23 years Billy, 23 years, Steely, 23 years. Um, I mean, I can go on and on in the, in the, in the teens, in the teens and over 20 years, people been working for me and these are, and today I reward them that they are all supervisors and managers and, but they stuck with me. They stuck with me, treated them well, made sure that they got paid. Um, when their friends during the recession were not getting paid, that was a common thing. People would do work and not get paid. You got to make sure you don't, you don't not pay the workers. That's one way to kill your reputation and screw people over. And you just, you just don't do that. And, and that would be, even if it was hurt, even when, when I'm getting hurt and I couldn't pay my bills, but I make sure that my staff are getting paid. That's the most important thing. Um, but I, I was lucky through the recession. I don't know if lucky, but I, 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 work, I worked hard to get my property sold and I got banks to work with me and negotiate with me. Why? Because I picked up the phone every morning and I called those banks and I said, hello, Linda, hello, Jeff, hello, Steve, with three different banks that I had developments going with. And I gave them an update of what I was doing. Because you've got to remember that those bankers during the recession, they're just people. And those people have got bosses to... 
uh, report to. And the last thing they want to go to their bosses and say, hey, Patterson Project Management can't get hold of them. They've gone AWOL for a month because they can't pay their mortgages. No, call them every single morning without fail. First calls of the morning. This is what we got going on. This is what happened yesterday. This is what happened with the other thing I said I was going to try to get some sales done. And they could go and answer to their bosses. So that helped me to sell off my properties and then, and then at ridiculously low money and lost tons of money and the banks ate, but, but ate, uh, ate a lot of uh, their, um, they, they took losses as well. But it then allowed me to finish the work on that by paying, keeping my staff busy to finish work on these projects that we knew we were going to sell and make no money on, but I could just keep my staff busy. That's all I cared about. Keep my staff busy, keep my relationships with the banks sound and not ruin my credit. That is, that was my focus. And I did that. Came out of the recession, good credit, great credit, and all my key staff and could just build from that and just jump right back in. It was great. It seems to me if I was just going to take two things away, it's servant leadership and clear communication are what really took you through this this time in terms of talent retention. It was clear communication. Well, first of all, starting, it was you evaluated your own lifestyle and you said, how can I optimize my lifestyle to get us through a time that might not have not been as fruitful as the past you know decade we have been building in? And how can I optimize our life to support the business and support the team members? That sounded like it was step number one. And then step number two, you communicate to your team exactly what you did probably as a servant leader. It's a lot easier to hear, hey, you might be taking a pay cut or you might be taking a demotion, but you're not getting fired if you, the leader, are also taking a pay cut but not getting fired, right? Like you're, 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 you're on the same level in some ways. You're showing your team that everyone has skin in the game as a part of the business, but also you're not like other GCs who just let people go in tough times to support the cash flow. You're doing whatever you can to keep them on and on board. And you're clearly communicating that and your team stuck with you. They bought in. And then two decades later, you look and you see a staff full of people who are familiar faces from 20 years plus ago. And that's what a lot of companies would kill to have in, in this industry is that level of loyalty. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's right. huge right there. Well, well, that then builds up all the, the new people that come in, they see that loyalty from the other people. They see that, why, why would people stay with me for 20 years? Why would people stay with me for 10 years? Um, you got to ask if you, if you're a new person coming to work for me, they're going to look at that and go, wow, that's, that's great. All these key people have been here for so long. They all got good jobs. They all are taken care of. Maybe if, if I can stick with this company for that much time, I'll have that too. And, you know, e even now, let's forget about the recession. I mean, even now you, you get your ups and downs in, in, in all businesses. Our economy does this. Sometimes we've got so much work lined up that we don't know what to do with ourselves. And sometimes you're looking at it going, hmm, we're now... 15 management strong and 40 staff is that enough work to sustain us we always have a lot of work but is it enough work for the size that we built the company well as things go through their ebbs and flows we make i make sure that i take care of i still take care of my staff even if it even when it hurts me even when it hurts me because i'll give you an example this last year things are uh this last six months and the future six months, people are concerned. Is there enough work? You know, uh, I'm hearing a lot of construction companies laying off people all over the place, especially, especially commercial, because there's major commercial issues uh, going on right now, major commercial banking issues, major, major commercial building issues. So even if residential is still doing okay, um, it, it start, it's going to start feeling it's, if you're starting to feel the pinch. Even if people don't want to admit that there's a pinch, there is a pinch. We're lucky here in South Florida that a lot of people from New York, Chicago, California, around the country are moving here. So that's been our saving grace. But stock market hasn't been as great in the last six, seven, eight months as it was the previous two, three, four years. Um, so people's businesses have been struggling a little. So you end up, you've got clients that might not, we might have tons of work, but you've got clients that might not pay as quick as what they used to, 
or as easy as they used to. You got many bank loans on houses, the clients' loans, that the banks are, all the banks are tightening. We know that there's a banking crisis in this country that's been going on since the beginning of the year. And um, banks are tighter on their draws. So that then affects us. So even though all this work is there, are you getting the money as quick as what you need to? And if you're not, well, that affects your profitability. It affects your, uh, and, and, and when you're a management heavy company, that profitability, that gross profitability is what pays the management. So if that's being strained because you can't get payments as quick as what you used to, um, well, that slows down production, which then slows down gross profit, which then it's, you know, things start to get, start to get tight. And that's actually what we're, that's what we're experiencing right now. We still have eight houses under construction. We still have three houses about to start. But what we're finding is that just the, the ability to move those houses fast, there were, there were the issues with, uh, uh, with, with, with deliveries. There were issues, you know, the, 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 we, we all know what the issues that came from, from COVID. We all dealt with it. We got over it. Uh, now we're dealing with issues. I might be changing subject a little bit here, but it's all, it's all about employees. You know, my goal is to retain my employees, but I need them to understand that the whole country is feeling a bit of a squeeze. Even though people don't want to admit it, there is, there is, there is a squeeze. And it's just slowing things down. The companies that we would buy material for, for example, a very unique kind of paver that I'm waiting for, should normally take two months. It's taking five months. Why? Because if you if you put it back, you'll see that that company that produces that particular paver doesn't want to hire more people because they worried about a looming recession. So they're keeping their workforce down, but the work is still coming and we still have the work but they're just not producing it enough because they don't want to expand their workforce and then have to uh, lay people off later because of this looming recession that we all keep, keep hearing about. So that's just a microchasm of a lot of things that have been going on in the industry. But we adapt. Um, and as long as I can keep my key staff, um, as things change, we'll come out of it strong. So in other words, you have your teams back when times get tough. The goal is to show your team, if at all possible, that you have their back in this situation when times aren't, you know, as they were maybe in the last few years. And your team understands that and they get on board. And that's probably another reason why they buy into your leadership. And on the topic of leadership, to dive a little bit further into that, I'd love to discuss maybe some of the guiding principles or philosophies that you follow as a leader to help make your team and your company more successful. What would you say those are? My guiding principles as a leader. So I have ways that I run my company that I'll, I'll, I can get into next that uh, are key. But my, my, my guiding principles are we are a service industry. We are a service industry and most people in construction don't get that. We think we're in the construction industry. No, there's a lot of people in the construction industry, but if we're not in this high end luxury market, we are about service. And if you're not giving that excellent service, our product is construction, but we have to give it to our clients with amazing service, then then we're not going to grow. I mean, that's my philosophy. Um, that's my overarching philosophy. And it might just be because I come from, again, my formative years paying for college and paying for everything was the service industry. And it was just drummed into me. And I feel like I, I then went into hotels and then and while in construction, and then it all just went into construction. And I feel like I just kept that service, service, mm -hmm. service, 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 mm -hmm. make the clients love working with us. That's not normal for construction. Construction, you know, you always hear people talk about, oh, my damn contractor. Yeah, I've got to have a meeting with my contractor or something like that. It's always, there's never great stories about construction. I want it the other way around. And that's what we strive for, service. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> my question is because the space is so 
high level. There's such, you know, successful and unique individuals you deal with at this high net worth individual space. And there's such high demands or expectations sometimes when someone's going to have this big contract with you. You know, everyone can talk about having great customer service. Anyone can say I have great customer service. The customer service required at one job might be different than the customer service required at a level like this. How do you as a leader set the bar of what great, amazing customer service looks like for people who come onto the team? And, you know, you, you don't want to give them too much rope to where they could hurt a project's success. You know, you want to guide them and show them like the Patterson way, if you will. How do you do that? Okay. So that's the key is remember my background, I come from, um, I explained in the beginning, I was... I was, I went through a lot of training courses and, um, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a big franchise environment, corporate environment, and that corporate environments tend to have training manuals, tend to have, uh, processes and procedures to follow, tend to have great software that you have to, you have to use. You, um, so all of those things I've implemented into my construction company. That's how we give that great service. It is, we, we very strict on process. We very strict on, which is why I don't want to do renovations anymore, which is not that I try and just turn them or turn them down because we can't do them. Of course we can do them, but, but new construction follows strict processes much better than renovations. And that process for me is very important. And I, I, my job is to make sure that my staff are maintaining our processes which are starting with amazing reporting and communication to the client and to me and to the rest of each other, us within our management of the company. Now remember we're, we're 15 managers strong from four project managers uh, to each project manager. So that's another part of my process is each project manager has permanently assigned supervisors, one to two supervisors per project manager. So those supervisors work only for that project manager, not mix and match between different houses. So they will, and all the staff will help each other when necessary, but their main focus will be on the particular houses under that project manager. Then we have uh, two full-time permit expediters and plan expediters that, so that the project managers aren't trying to run permits deal with architects, picking stuff up, dropping stuff off, deal with the paperwork, fill out paperwork, get subcontractors to sign things and do this. And they don't have to even worry about that. All they need to worry about is the house, the project, um, the subcontractors, the, the proposals. But then, but then even that is, is, is assisted by my operations director, which is my partner, Jessica. She oversees uh, all these people, she oversees the controller, she oversees the permit expert, she oversees the marketing manager. And I oversee everybody, but what she does is take all the work that all these different levels are doing and make sure that they are cohesive. But what, what I don't do is let one person try to do the other person's job. I'm very strict with keeping, you're a site supervisor, you're not a project manager. You're a project manager, you're not the site supervisor. You've got to train your site, site supervisor. They work for you. That's training the trainer and the site supervisor. What I tell them always is you must constantly be training subcontractors. Do not let a single subcontractor come onto the job and act like they know what they're doing and they are the carpenter. They are the tiler. They are the painter. Don't tell me how to do my job. If that's their attitude, they're not allowed to work on my job. I tell my staff, we make these houses great, not the subcontractors. We've got to hire good subcontractors that are willing to work with us and within our systems, but we make them great. So those project managers are training the supervisors all the time. The supervisors are training the staff and the subcontractors staff all the time. So training people constantly, I let them know you are, don't think of yourselves as managers. Think of yourselves as teachers. Always. You're always teaching. And I'm always teaching them. Our, the other thing that we do to, uh, is we have our weekly meetings with all of our staff. Every Tuesday, 10 a.m., no one's going to get hold of us because for three or four hours, we are 15 of us in a big, either in person or Zoom, 
believe it or not, we found uh, in person is not as good as Zoom these, these days. We can all be in the same offices right next to each other, but we'll be on Zoom because you can collaborate more with easier on Zoom, um, sharing, showing, opening plans, adjusting things. And I'll make sure that that meeting, we go over every single job. We talk about the project management side, the supervisor side, and the permit expediter side. And, and then the controller side as well, because the flow of money in, in construction is everything about everything in this high end construction. You've got to keep that money flowing and you got to, and that doesn't mean that you've got to just pay everybody quickly. You've got to pay everybody the right time when they need to be paid. Because if you throw too much money at subcontractors and they spend it where they shouldn't spend it, you get screwed on the other end. So we together as a team discuss all the jobs, even if there's four project managers and we discuss each one of their jobs and that doesn't involve them, they are listening to what we're talking about on the other project manager's job and the other supervisors are listening to what's going on in their job. And then when they hear issues and they could say, hey, well, I'm dealing with that same subcontractor and he did X, Y, and Z. Well, like, hold on, we've got a different sub doing this job on that job. Here's an example of how you can fix. So they, we're very big on experience share Nobody wants opinions. Opinions are for assholes. You just, everybody's got one. You want an experience share. So my other staff are listening to the issues going on on the other jobs and sharing their experiences on ways to fix it and help with it. So that's key. Those meetings are, th those meetings are key. We then, we don't miss that meeting. It's never like, hey guys, we can't do that meeting. Uh, it, you have to have that meeting every single week, no matter what is going on. Sometimes it's the project manager, well, project managers would say, oh, I'm too busy. I can't take three or four hours out of my day to do this meeting. I don't care. You will, because that is how we, we, there's so much that goes on in construction and it's so confusing and so big that that meeting grounds us every week. It brings us all back to now we all know what's going on everywhere and we can focus on the issues. We have staff uh, client meetings bi-weekly, um, which is which it's hard to make, enforce st clients showing up for those meetings because sometimes they're like, man, I've got to have another meeting with you, but we try to force it. Every two weeks, we, we now, what's great with Zoom is they can come on Zoom. It's no longer, they don't have to come on site. We get on Zoom, we go over bids, proposals, change orders, the schedule, schedule, extremely important. We go over every little thing so that that client as well in their head is now relaxed. Okay. I know everything going on on site. I know what my tasks are while we're meeting with them. We, it's very important for us to go into any meeting with, whether it's a subcontractor or, a, or a, um, or a client, we go into those meetings. We do the work for the client. We don't say to the client, we need you to have this and this and this and this and this done. We will put the stuff in list form for them. We will tell them who to talk to, where to talk. We will help set up the meetings. We'll do the meetings with them. We do all the work for them. We have it in beautiful to do's that is, that is, that, 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 that we collaborate with the clients or the designers on these big to do forms uh, on our software. And we say, client, just can we check this one off? Have you done this? Yes. Have you done this client? Yes. Okay. We've done X, Y, Z, check, 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 check. And those, those meetings are very important and they're tough because everybody thinks they've got things under control and they don't have time for meetings and meetings take up a lot of time, but they're so important. We force them. Then our management software, the key to everything, having a good management software, things I learned from, from working for big corporate environments, too many builders don't have proper management software. And if they do have management software, they don't program it correctly. Garbage in is garbage out. Okay. So you've got multiple kinds of management software. Uh, there's Procore, there's Builder Trend. I've heard of a, one or two others. We've done lots of research and we like, we like Builder Trend for high end residential construction. And the key to it though, is programming your schedules, your base schedule of a house correctly or project. Now I've taken it a step further. I've programmed my schedules to be so big and so intense that build a trend 
the actual software company complains to me that it's too big and it's and it's it's slowing down their software and nobody else has it programmed as big as, as complicated as I have it with meaning you know there's three different tracks in a house inside outside and site so three different tracks all have links you move one thing the next thing everything else changes with those links but I take that a step further because I use my I use my schedule as a training tool for my staff and a training tool for my clients. Remember, I come from a training background. Everything is teaching, teaching, teaching. So you can't just teach by talking. You've got you to write stuff down. And I've done that in the schedule. That it goes right down to, if you don't know how to build a big luxury home, you take my schedule, you will know how to build a big luxury home. From when to call F Florida Power and Lights to do something, when to check your burn, when to call for this inspection before this inspection, how long before to order your order your survey marks, not just do the survey, how much time do you need to order the survey because they're not just going to show up the next day. It literally tells you like a five-year-old what to do and how to do it. Now, how that helps, that helps my staff because there's a thousand actions that have to happen. They can't remember them all, but helps my clients as well because clients would always, the, the most phone calls I would get in a day used to be many, many years ago before I wrote this program, uh, programmed this program. Um, what's next, Terry? What are we doing next? When are we pouring the concrete? When are we laying the floors? When are the, when's the roof going on? When's the, why, 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 why? I don't get a single phone call anymore because right now the clients, they play on our software like Facebook. Um, they, it, 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 it emails them what's going on. If they're a needy client that wants to know every little thing, we just click one button on the software and the software emails the weekly schedule or the daily schedule to them. Eventually they say, can you please shut that thing off? It keeps on emailing me. Okay, we shut it off, but then we need you to at least be logging in once a week, having a look at the schedule, which they do because it's it's an enjoyable program. You can do it on your, on your phone, you can do it on your computer, you can, you can do it anyway. But I keep saying garbage in is garbage out. If you don't program those schedules properly, then it's not going to work. And it needs to be done well enough that when you're two thirds of the way through the project and you've had many changes in the schedule, every time you change something, everything else must be linked to it. And that's difficult. You've got to understand uh, predecessors. You've got to understand what comes before, what comes after, because every time you move one thing in construction, it affects everything. Now, where that helps is client says to me, hold on, I want to change, hold on, hold on, I don't think I like what that floor, I'm gonna, what that stuff, that pool deck product is going to be. I want to change it. Okay, but what you chose is going to take four weeks to get here, and we were about to install this other stuff, and it said, okay, don't worry about it, it's not going to affect anything. Of course it is. Well, now we can't do the columns that get set on there, we can't do the outside bar, we can't do this, we can't do that, and all these things that are linked in the schedule, we can show them online. Okay, look, if we don't do the pool deck, I'm going to move this, Look at what happens to the end date, the certificate of occupancy date. That's the only thing that everybody cares about. So that's the beauty of using a very good management software, but then programming it correctly. I spent more time than you can possibly imagine programming the software. My weekly meetings, I spend so much time on top of my project managers, making sure that they are doing their to-do lists and the to-do lists have main subject and then many other sub subjects and the actual items now the actual items that need to get taken care of once the project managers have written all this up with the supervisors and they keep adding to it as things happen well now they can relax that their supervisors are actually doing these things because every morning this thing goes straight to their phone or it's on the on the front of their computer here's all the to-dos that we have not completed and every Tuesday at 10 a.m. when they get into a meeting with me I'm going through the stuff going why is this not done why is this not done and they don't want to have to answer in front of the 15 other management well because I just didn't get to it you know they have pride themselves so that's the reason I involve all the staff in these meetings one of the reasons is that all the staff are accountable to each other and as well as they can all help each other but that management software it's key. The daily logs showing um, every day that you've got to take photos, videos, daily logs, list what's going on on the job sites. Um, 
that's key because clients forget about conversations you have. So you list them on the daily logs, met with client, this is the discussion, this is what we had. Recaps of meetings. Yes, we email them to people, but we put them on our daily logs so that nobody six months later can say, why did this not happen? Why did that not happen? Well, because this is what you said on November 2nd, uh, 2021. Here's the log. This is what happened. Um, those are those are key. So this, this overwhelming amount of uh, communication on where the schedule is, where it's going to be, where we're at today, logs, it also helps have the client relax. The clients know at all times, we know everything that's going on. Too often, clients are worried about general contractors like, and there's so much going on. How are they keeping track of all this stuff? Well, we've got it right here. List point form for you to read and see in a beautiful software that consolidates everything in an amazing way for you to just click it on your phone, click it on your computer. Change orders. Another big thing with contractors that causes issues, change orders. Our change order system is amazing because it's beautifully laid out all the change orders. You can click on it and see the actual invoices attached with all the detail. And you can do this from your phone. You can accept or decline and sign from your phone while you might be traveling in Europe. Um, and we're trying to build your house over here. We don't have to wait for our once uh, every two week meeting or a once a month billing to let you know what something's going to cost that you've asked for on a change order. You can just sign it from your phone. We get those notifications as soon as it's approved. And if it's not approved by our two week meeting, we're like, hey man, you saw these change orders, you're holding us up. This is what you're doing. You asked for this, we're doing it for you. Sign it so we can do the work. Another thing, don't start the work without a signed change order. That's another key thing with builders. They do all this work, they build their clients and the client's like, I'm not paying for that. No, they ask for something. You write up a change order as quick as possible. It goes to their phone, hopefully within hours or a day, they sign off on it or question it. Both are important. Or decline it, because that's just as important as accepting a change order. Because then you've got the record that they've declined, that they wanted something. Sometimes we know that they're going to decline something, but we do it as we do it anyway, so that we can get the record of them declining. So the point is, I'm giving you a long version of uh, the processes are very important. And what myself and Jessica, my partner, does, we make sure that our staff follow those processes. Jessica is all day on this program, doing the change orders, doing the bids, doing the adjusting, do, making sure that the staff are doing their side correctly. Because if you let them start not doing, inputting into the software correctly, it then becomes a mess. I mean, to be able to do $20 million a year in construction and um, eight, nine, 10 big com complicated houses with so many different choices and interior designers and architects and engineers and owners and everybody's opinion. If you don't have a good software programmed and run and operated correctly, you cannot do it. Don't even try to do this. This high-end luxury construction is not for the builder with his dog in the back of his F-150 and a whole bunch of plans in the back with, by his toolbox. That's, those days are gone. You, you, just, you just can't build a house like that efficiently. So if I was to keep this very black and white, this seems to me like, first of all, a leadership masterclass for high-end luxury residential builders. And I think about it from this perspective, again, going back to the black and white piece, if you take two types of companies, two types of construction companies, let's just say, one company is more of the mindset that if you have a question, come ask me, I, I'm maybe hiring you with the expectation that you know these things or that maybe you'll go figure these things out. And really, there's not as much intentional training. It's more reactive training. And, yes. and a lot of times, like scheduled meetings, even on a monthly basis, are pretty unheard of like meeting with an executive leader at the company and actually getting that one-to-one -one or one-to-a-few contact within the team. And that can obviously leave someone with a lot of questions, with a lack of mentorship, a lack of ability to grow, lack of quality of work that doesn't align with the company's standards because they weren't there to QA to provide leadership and guidance. And on the flip side of things, you've taken a whole different approach and you have a culture based on intentional mentorship 
hands-on mentorship, accountability to very thorough, thoughtful systems and processes that can help teach someone who doesn't even understand this from your words, the process, yes. right? And so that goes down to your people are intentionally training. You have seasoned leaders who are, are showing them what greatness looks like. You document what greatness looks like. So it's pretty hard to have an excuse in your company not to know what the Patterson way looks like. And it's also pretty hard to get away with not holding up to a standard of greatness because your team's there to oversee that. And I think a top performer looks at that as a blessing because they want to be great. They want to get better. Accountability for someone who's a top performer is actually a good thing because it keeps them on track toward their goals and it helps them improve because that's what they want is to be great. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me you've built a culture surrounding around that, which can really unpack so many cans of worms and conversations. And we may even need to do another podcast someday because there's so many things to unpack here. But really, I am curious. A topic of conversation, again, we want to go back to is retention of talent, right? You can re you can recruit talent, but keeping them is also very valuable. It's a high ROI initiative for a company. It also is great for culture. It, you know, it's a people business, right? So keeping the best people is great. And burnout is something on these types of big projects that can be unfortunate. You're dealing with high stakes, high stress situations with high dollar figures and people who might have high expectations. And you want to make sure you do a good job by them and you you keep the relationship going. And, and these aren't things that are always easy, but it seems like you've built a lot of systems and processes that help you achieve that. Would you say that everything you just explained contributes to your team not getting burned out on big projects and being able to be consistently working on, it sounds like one to maybe two big homes at a time, because if you have four PM, four managers and eight projects going at a time, it sounds like that's two managers to one project or maybe something like that. So that there's capacity they need to be able to put out with that. How do, how do you keep them consistently showing up at their best? As I, as I explained, I have set it up in a way that most construction companies that have a project manager who ends up having to take on everything. They're doing permitting, bidding, uh, site supervision, client relations meetings. They're doing the, 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 the GCs assign a PM and that person's just doing it all. I can have each pro project manager handling two homes at full, full steam ahead with another one that is maybe in punch out stage and another one that is maybe in uh, permitting and starting. I don't really hand it over to them because I, I, until the house is ready to start. But even once the house is ready to start, I have a construction, I have a shell, we do our own shells and we do our own drywall framing and we do our own civil in-house. Um, it's just a way that we keep control. Um, but I have a structural manager who takes care of the beginning part as well. So the project managers only have to really start worrying about it once we've got the pilings in and we've got the slabs in place and we're starting to, the shell's starting to go up. And then they've got a few things to do, like uh, uh, trusses or floor systems or, or, or shoring systems, and a few things the project managers do, but not too much. They can focus on the other two houses that are in full swing. So how they don't burn out, how I have that retention, is that each person must stay in their lane. And, that's, and they like that. They like that. You're going to be a project manager, you just project manage. You're going to be the structural manager, then you just manage our structural staff building the show. They, they enjoy being a structural manager. Most guys in construction are, look, if they were all like me, they wouldn't work for me. But you, you, can't, you can't push your staff to all just want to do everything like I'm doing all over the show, tons of things. I love it. I love the, I want to know and do everything. But your staff aren't necessarily there. Project managers are closest to the people to be there, but I would rather my project managers be able to take on multiple big jobs and do them perfectly and have these amazing relationships with the clients and amazing relationships with the subcontractors and watch every penny of, of money so that we're not, so the clients aren't overpaying and we're not overpaying. Um, you know, that's their job. Supervisor, you must just focus on what happens on the job site every day, today and through to next week? What's happening now? Don't worry about what this proposal is going to be and uh, the engineering on this cantilevered, whatever. We're, we're, we'll deal with that. 
Um, same with the, 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 um, even marketing. I have a marketing manager so that she can just go and uh, help find new work, meet with architects, um, meet with uh, podcast people like yourself, and meet with uh, other suppliers or, or, or magazines not have to worry about the, the construction. However, she's in all the construction meetings because I need, even the marketing manager needs to understand construction, understand the things that we're going through so that when, when she's having a, um, a video made for our marketing, um, she understands what to say to the videographer, when they should go to a job and interview my, my staff or, or go to, to a house. She has to understand construction. So, and then, and then all those people have the assistance from operations director, which would be my partner, Jessica, who's also a GC, who's been with me for 20 years, who's my right hand in all my, all my businesses, um, and can think like me if they can't get hold of me because I'm busy with a client or busy with something. She's there. So they never have those, I try to take away those normal stresses that you have in normal construction companies. Now to do that, you've got to be big. I'm not saying everyone can do that. Um, not necessarily as big as, as we are, because I've always had that even when we were smaller, but you, you, you can't just be a one house kind of person. Um, that, but that's, and that's what I want to, that's, I have to stay big and I have to keep enough work so that I can keep these processes in place. And these processes are the way that you build these big, fancy houses. I do not know how small builders can, how people trust small builders, nothing to knock small builders, but they should not be trying to take on four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve million 10, 11, $12 million dollar contracts. You try and manage a $10 million dollar contract with owner's reps and owners and lawyers and, and uh, interior designers and architects, engineers, and everyone involved. And everything is a strict process governed by a very strict legal document and you step out of line with these things and you're ending up in court. So you, you, that's how my staff don't get burnt out. They have their role, you do your role and the next, and you make sure the next person does their role. And I make sure the person above you does their role. That's what it is. And they love it. They, uh, they obviously love it. They're staying with me. I think they love it. I like to say they love it, but they're, they're staying with me. Yeah. And people try and steal my staff all the time, which, you know, which I hate because, you know, you spend all this time training people, teaching them to be this way, and they get this amazing experience on the kinds of houses that my project managers get to run. Most GCs don't get to build these kind of houses in their lifetime, some of them. They're crazy and amazing and huge. And it, people want to steal my staff all the time, but luckily, luckily they stay. I mean, I've had, you know, you have a few people leave here and there, but they typically tend to be people that didn't fit within our culture in the first place. So, and it's tough. So I think one of the things that you, you, you do recruiting, okay? So what your goal would be is to find people like me, good talent that will fit into my culture. And, and so, and, and, and that's important because Obviously, all the people, uh, half the people that I have have come through recruiting and through hiring and through uh, not just work their way up, while the other half work, have worked their way up. So I like to have, and in both my companies, the Yacht Club as well, it's the same thing. It's half work their way up and half, half recruiting. I enjoy taking on new people because I want new, fresh ideas. It can't just all be my ideas and what we've, what I've instilled on my people. Um, some of the best things that we've learned have come from new people that have come through recruiting. Uh, but, but, but the most dedication has come from people that have worked their way up. But the people who come through recruiting tend to, after many, many, many years, you got that dedication too, and they work their, 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 their way up. So I think I'm going on a tangent here, but uh, to talent, Talent recruiting and retention, I mean, it's, it's very important to, I feel, to do both, half from within, half from outside sources. But sometimes 
when you bring people, and you must be ready for this. You bring people in from outside. So when you bring people in from within, you got to spend a lot of time training them. When you bring in them from outside sources, you're hoping you're hiring them and paying them the right amount of money for the experience that they've got gained from other people. And then they want to bring that experience that they've got from other people. You hope that it's a great experience and that you can incorporate it into your business. Sometimes you can't. Um, sometimes they don't work. Sometimes they are set in their ways or they were a GC of the, by themselves and then they decided they want to be a project manager. And you know, GCs don't really have bosses other than their clients. So they come in to work for me and we have this structured system and a hierarchy and it doesn't work. Well, then, you know, as Kenny Rogers said, you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them and know when to walk away and know when to run. So you've got to, you've got to be able to, a very important part of my job is being able to know when to fire somebody as well. You don't want to be that guy. You want to also make sure that when you're firing, when you're hiring and when you're firing people, you need to remember that all eyes are on you. All your other staff are watching you, what you do, how you treat that person, um, how you treat them in the hiring and how you treat them in the firing. More important, how you treat them in the firing. I make my firing very public. Um, I want all my managers to understand this is what's happening and this is why. What do you think? Am I wrong? Please tell me if I'm wrong. Um, and, and before I make it public, we're all together discussing it. I have individual discussions with people in the, in the company because we're in these meetings together. So they see how these other people act. They see how those other people's jobs are running. They see if there's issue. So if they, I like to hear my staff say to me, no, Terry, it's your fault that they like this because you allowed him to do this or you didn't give him this opportunity or you never gave him the right supervisor. Okay, I hear you. Let's, let me, let me, let me see if I can adapt a few things and make him better. We'll, we'll try. And if it doesn't work, I like my staff to know why that person got fired, uh, be, be, in, be involved with it. And, and I, want to, I want them to agree that it was right for us to lose this person because how I treat the people that I fire and then during their firing, they get treated very, very well. And you don't wanna, you don't wanna just jump in and yell and scream and go, get out of here. Your other staff are looking at that and they, they don't want to be treated like that. I think that they will ever be treated like that. So that's, that's also key. How you hire and fire people, your eyes are always on you. And most definitely. And it's, it seems like you get team buy-in and it's a team effort in, in a lot of the things you do within your company. And it sounds like there's a level of trust between you and the other leaders on your team, which is great. Um, and something to consider too, I think it's so interesting how you break down about half of the people in your companies come up from the, the coming up through the ranks and the other half come from recruitment, because as you build a business, as long as you have the work and the pipeline of jobs to sustain growth, then it really does become sort of a teeter totter or like a seesaw as a leader, right? It's how can I bring people up, but I can't be the leader who's mentoring and bringing everybody up because there's only one me and there's only one of as many leaders as we have. So it's how can we sprinkle the team? with seasoned leaders who really do know how to mentor and train and hold accountable to standard and develop. And this is, this is the other piece of the puzzle, right? It's like bring people up, mentor them. And not everyone can start at the bottom and mentor each other because then it's just the blind leading the blind in some respects. So you need the, that leadership aspect. And so you understand that there's that seesaw and that you've invested into talent strategically to be leaders for your company. And so it sounds like that's paying off and then combine that with transparency and clear communication and, you know, a culture that it has such a high standard. And it sounds like it's a good culture to be a part of in many ways for the people who enjoy being there for decades at a time. It sounds like that's a nice mix that you've put together to tack on to that retention while also building a culture of hiring and, or promoting internally as well, which is important for people. And then I'll make it easy for them in their lives as well. If they have, you know, in our company, one of our employees is a full-time nanny. Oh, nice. Full-time nanny. As uh, I got a lot of, I, I, I firmly believe in, listen, my, my um, um, two of my project managers are, are, are women. My operations director is woman is a woman. I, um, and, in, and in construction, I mean, these women are stronger than any men I've ever hired as project managers on site, better 
more detail oriented, more like just, I believe, I give, I tend to favor uh, women in construction because I found that they are more organized, more disciplined, and if there's anything that they're lacking in any knowledge in construction, I can teach them and they learn. They take it in, they suck it in. Um, and to do that, you have to recognize that there is, they have kids, they get pregnant, they have babies, because remember they stay with me for a long time. So it's not like I'm going through, I'm going through the people who work, work with me, I'm going through so, so much of their life is with me that I see their babies and, and all that. So if I'm not offering them a way to make their lives easier by giving them this a very highly paid and highly skilled housekeeper, not, not, I mean, not housekeeper, nanny, who is, who is trained, trained night nurse and trained who, to actually take care of young babies and take care of kids properly, not just some random person that can just be there and take care of them. Somebody who is, who is good enough, who can drive the kids to school, pick them up from, uh, from camp, um, really assist. And then I would give them space at, uh, at, the, at the offices if they want them to be at the office. They, they, they can do that too, but typically they tend to have them at their houses and sometimes a couple of the, a couple of the ladies that their kids would all be together, but it, it's important. The other thing I do for them is, is I'm very easy going on time off. Somebody needs time off, take the time off. Uh, yes, we have our, and, and, we, and we start by employing people and not this, not by giving them this American two week vacation thing. I don't believe in a two week vacation for staff. I think that's ridiculous. Management, you gotta start with three weeks plus you get your other vacation days. And even with that, I'm easy going with that too. If they end up taking more than that, I honestly don't care. Now, for that leniency, I expect a lot from them too. I expect their dedication. I expect that when they get in phone calls at seven, eight o'clock at night, they are on it. I expect that when they go to start at, start at seven and work till seven, they will do it. It's not every day, they don't have to, that's not the way this job goes. But when the time comes that they gotta be somewhere on a weekend or whatever, they're gonna, they're gonna do it. But I'm very easy going, they give me that, I, and I feel I give it them first. I first say, listen, I'm easy going. This is what I expect from you. Um, I'm not being easy going and giving them whatever assistance I can give them after they should prove to me who they are. I will prove to you who I am first. And let's hope you can keep up with me on who I am. And if you don't, well, and you can't do the job properly and you don't fit within the culture, We'll know within a year, it takes us about a year, and we'll probably replace you. Mm -hmm. Naturally, if you want to keep that standard upheld for the team, you can't let people who aren't in line with that standard continue to be around, or that could become a cancer culture. Not to be, you know, some people just isn't the right person for the right company, and that just is what it is. They might have been a great individual, but maybe just wasn't a culture fit, and that is yeah. part of the business. So. As a leader, sometimes these are decisions we have to make for the betterment of everyone else on the team, because if someone is affecting everyone else on the team so dramatically, it probably would be best for everyone for that person to maybe yep. find a new home, not just best for the company. Ultimately, it might sting in the moment, like getting fired is never fun. Getting let go is never fun. Having an employee leave is never fun. But yeah. at the end of the day, if, if you just realize that if we can keep our mindset about what could be best for everybody in the long term, it probably ended up to be best. Um, yeah. So interesting for me, you own a yacht club, right? What was the inspiration behind owning that yacht club? And also, I'm curious, have you found any synergies between that and your construction business? Absolutely. So buying the yacht club, uh, Lighthouse Point Yacht Club, um, unbelievable, amazing place. Uh, 2016, 2014, I came across it because I would uh, bought my property, uh, which is actually my house, is overlooks the yacht club. And... Uh, I, I tried to buy it in 2014, didn't, didn't work out. 2016, it came available for me again, and I uh, managed to get it all to work. By 2017, closed on it. It's 10-acre property, 78 uh, big yacht marina, and uh, 
big clubhouse, banquet halls, uh, mini Olympic swimming pool. It's got 10 tennis courts and uh, gym and fitness rooms. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing place. And I init initially I bought it thinking that I'm going to, I knew nothing about yacht clubs at that point. I'd hung out at yacht clubs. I'd, uh, I'm a big boater, very big boater. Boating for me has been, is everything since, uh, since 2001, I bought my first 25 foot boat and was going off to the keys all the time on it. Um, and then in 2003 or bigger boats, yachts into the Bahamas. Back into 2005, I bought a $2 million big yacht, way too big of a yacht for a 29 year old, but I did it anyway. And I just went boating all up the East Coast, the Bahamas, the Keys, was, it was my life. And I got a lot of experience, um, probably way too young buying these big yachts, but it was my passion, my life. I would, I would put every last dollar and every, everything into it. I love boating and a yacht club that had 10 acres, was it 10 acres with seven, seven and a half acres of upland, just to me was, and it's all waterfront the whole way around it. And in Lighthouse Point, right near Hillsborough Inlet, I was like, this is a, this is a, this development opportunity of note. I mean, it's phenomenal. W went ahead, did, did some research. City said, uh, somebody, this, the head of planning and zoning had said, yes, the city knows that we've got to maybe change some zoning over there so we can do some development and not just have a yacht club. And so I went ahead um, with my partner and bought it and then went and a week later got a call from the mayor of the city who said, uh, come and see me. Like, oh, wow, mayor wants to see me. Great. Come to see him. And uh, he pretty much told me, oh, no, we're not going to allow any development on that site. You can build another yacht club if you want, but you're not building houses and townhouses to pay for your New York club. We're not going to change the zone. So I was like, okay, um, why did I do this? And I then spent the next year convincing all of the members of the club and the community by spending a lot of time with them, a lot of time with them, growing to love the whole yacht club community and what the yacht club stood for, not just coming in as a developer. Um, with my big ideas and wanting to demolish it all, build a new clubhouse and build all these sites and sell them. I had to actually spend a year getting to know everybody. Um, I then also in that year changed the whole culture of the yacht club, started getting in a younger, younger demographic, started taking people on these boat trips that I had spent so many years doing and loving and getting to know the Bahamas and the Keys and the East Coast of the United States. I used that knowledge and said, you know what, guys, come with me. First four or five boats would follow me on a trip. And then I would do, then the next trip, I maybe get a few more and then a few more, then a few less. And then all of a sudden the word got out that these trips were just absolutely amazing, which they really are. I, I today lead the largest group of boaters that traveling boaters that we go, um, we'll take our 45, 50 to 90 footers. We, um, we've got up to 125 footer in, in our, in our marina, but, um, typically the boats that travel around with me would be in the fifties to 90 foot range. And we go off to the Exumas for two weeks and then the Southern Exumas another two weeks. And we go off to Key West and, uh, dry Tortugas for 10 days. And we do, we, we, we do, uh, Bimini where we've got 200 members come off to Bimini with us. We have um, Ocean Reef, we have 200 members come down to Ocean Reef with us, and we do big parties in all these places that we go. I take yacht club staff, and uh, up sometimes up to six or seven yacht club staff have to come just to just to make these 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 long weekends or 10 day trips uh, really work out. And I I just I won the hearts and minds of the people in the club and then the community, at least enough, because trust me, there's a lot of people who say to developers, you're an ass, we're never gonna support you, we hate what you're doing. Um, so you, you definitely have your naysayers. But after winning the hearts and minds through actually being involved with people in the yacht club and growing to love the culture myself, they then got the city to listen to what I want to do and got the commissioners to listen to what I want to do which then overruled what the mayor was saying. Um, no, um, 
they got the planning and zoning board to listen to what I want to do. And it took me six, six and a half years to get it all approved. But thanks to the people, the members of Lighthouse Point Yacht Club, helping me the whole way, we got this whole development approved. And during that process, it turned me from just another developer buying a piece of land that I can develop and sell. And maybe I was going to maybe keep the marina to just have a cash cow to somebody who actually loves the actual club environment. So now the whole thing that I've designed there is about maintaining forever for my family, um, this club in club marina environment with some residences on the site. The reason I'm building the residences on the site is to uh, make the profit to help pay for the $50 million worth of new club that I have to build. Um, it's very expensive. It's very big and beautiful and amazing. And I need the development for that. It's not normally the way developers work. Developers develop so that they can sell it all off, make a whole lot of profit, take that money and move into the next development. But what I found is you do that as a developer. You, 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 you start off with a one size property, you make your profit, you build a bigger, you buy a bigger property, you build a bigger development. You make that profit, profit, you turn that profit, that the amount of cash that you have in your pocket equals how much more the bank's going to give you equals how big of a next project you can do. You do this over and over and over and over and eventually you're going to hit a downturn and a recession or a depression or a whatever. And all that money that you've built up, you lose because the banks keep their money. You're the one that loses your money. So I thought to myself, well, how am I going to get away from this cycle? And I decided as a developer, I no longer want to just build developments that just generate a whole bunch of profit that I can roll over to the next one. I want to build developments that go towards something that can generate recurring revenue. And that is what the Yacht Club does. And that is what any other development that I'll get involved with in the future needs to be able, needs to be able to do so that I can withstand the ups and the downs. Um, and so far, so good. It's all working out great. We're about to start. We're about to get all the permits for everything on the club. It's taken six and a half years. Um, we have all the residential permits ready. We're just waiting for the actual clubhouse permits. And then we get all the funding in place and start building. So that was, that's what got me into it. Where I am today in the Yacht Club was not how I started when initially buying the Yacht Club. And as any businessman will tell you, if you can't diversify as things change or as you learn more about something, then you, you, you can't be successful. You've taken such an interesting approach on construction. You've taken, it seems like many things you've learned from other areas of your life and applied, actually applied. So as an executive, this is the hard part is the actual application and the execution of so many of these ideas that many people might have thought of your ideas. Like, oh, how great would it be if I had a yacht club and if I'm a luxury home builder and I could just have all my ideal audience of customers right here, I could build relationships. But how many people actually go invest in the yacht club and are persistent enough to get that? And then how many are servant leaders going back to what you do before, going on these trips with people, gathering influence of all these people who have influence and being persuasive enough to be able to convince your local jurisdiction to allow you to build what you want to build. Like that's, that's amazing right there. And yeah. It just, all these things that I'm picking up along the way, it seems like you're a doer, you're an action taker, you hold yourself to a high standard and you really do execute. And for me, I'm just thinking this is again, a masterclass for running a, a business like yours, because yes, you do everything to get the referrals. Yes. You do everything to build the relationships. But if you, if people are picking up the bits of what you're sharing, that's not all you do. You have a marketing professional, you call it marketing. It's marketing and business development. It's intentional outbound outreach, building relationships, and as a leader, you've built yourself up as a business to where you can have someone doing that for you and you have other people executing the other parts of the business for you. So you could focus on your highest profit producing activities as a leader to continue driving the company forward. And on top of that, you have a yacht club. So you're, you're networking. So you're doing so yeah. many things that have helped you get to where you are. It's, it's really impressive, actually. Some people might be listening to this taking notes. Some people might be listening to this a little bit jealous that they didn't take action on these ideas earlier. Um, but with that said, I just think really there's so much to take away from this. And I really do appreciate you sharing. <laughs> it really is so impressive. That networking that you're talking about is that's, that's, that's key. 
And um, I try to tell all general contractors that if you're not out networking, get involved in charities so you can go meet people. Get involved voting. I'm building four of the houses I'm building today are people that I meet in the Bahamas. Voting. I mean, people, my staff think, well, you're out on vacation again with all those yacht club people. Yeah, I know it looks like that, but I'm out there building the trust, building relationships that when I come back here, that guy needs a 10, $20 million home build. Who do you think he's calling when he needs it? He's calling this guy because he's been in stressful situations with me, seen how I act on a two week trip and who I am and who my family is. And they trust me. You can build those through charities as well. We're involved in a lot of charities, raise a lot of money for lots of different things. And it's, it, it helps being in a yacht club, but my, my partner, Jessica, she, she's, she's, she has uh, lots of charities that she's involved with. That's not even uh, related to the yacht club, even though the yacht club has now gotten very involved in them, uh, like honor flight. And we do uh, four kids and we raise money for things in the Bahamas. And we, like we, we do so many now, do we do them because we love doing them? Yes. But it also is networking. You get out there, you're meeting people, other people are involved in these charities. So when they got a friend that needs a house built, who do you think they trust us? because they see that we're out there doing the right thing every day, helping other people, not looking for something from it. And that's it, another key. Don't, I don't believe in networking to look for a game. In my yacht club, for example, I don't, I only, as of a few months ago, for the first time, and I write, I write a magazine, I publish a magazine for my yacht club, big, glossy, beautiful magazine every month. A few months ago was the first time I started actually putting my construction company in that magazine. I do not go in there to network and promote my construction company. I want to, I want you to know me, trust me, and then you'll get to know who I am. And then if you want me to build you a house, great. But it's same with these charities that we do. And, and it's not that we're doing it to find someone to let us build them a house, but what happens with them, you're networking and you're involving other high net worth people in, into these charities too. And then they get to know who you are to your core and then they trust you and they when something might happen 10 years from now that they buy a piece of land and want to build a property and they will remember us because of the, all that networking that we do that's not networking we're not going out doing it to network like i have people call me and say hey we've got this networking event i don't go to one networking event ever ever i refuse i will not i don't like it i will just be me I'll let my family be my family and uh, Jessica will go out and be herself and because she's selfless, way more selfless than I am and gets involved in every charity she can possibly think of and wants to be on the boards and it's nuts. Not to get work though, but you get work from it. And if you're not getting yourself out there, I don't know who's going to trust you to build, you, build this big fancy house. You can build do renovations, you can market and get all the small stuff. But the big stuff that comes from trust. So network, get out there and get to know people. And that's, yeah, that's what the yacht clubs, the yacht clubs have been great with that. I can imagine. And we've talked a lot about winning work and we've talked a good amount about talent as well. When it comes to diving a little further into talent, right? Cause you talked earlier about culture fit. Culture fits important. It's not just about, can this person do the job? It's like, do they fit in with the culture? A lot of that goes into hiring process, recruitment process. Would you mind sharing how throughout your specific company's process, you evaluate for culture fit? Because I mean, experience is easier to evaluate for. You can conduct good reference checks. You can look at a project list. You can talk to them about their involvement on the project and all that good stuff. But how do you handle the, the, the culture fit side of the interview process? I hate to say it, but it's, it's, it's tough. It's one of the toughest things that we actually deal with because, um, I go into every, first of all, I like to think that most people are going to hear who we are during that. I, I will do a, a good hour interview and I will want to hear about them, but I want to talk about us too and see their reaction and what their answers are to the things that I'm saying about who we are. Um, Sometimes it's better just to listen, but when if you're just listening, you're getting whatever they're trying to put on you 
it's, it's a show. When someone's interviewing for a job, it's a show. And the better show they put on and convince you that they're good at something, you just, you just don't know. So I like to listen to what they have to say. And I like to talk about who we are and who our culture is. And while talking about it, throw off a couple of questions. Well, we do things like this. What do you think? What would you do? Do you think that's right? And just listen to what their answers are. But, but try not to guide, to guide their answers. Try not to ask direct questions. Just, it's tough though. Because if somebody is a good interviewer, they can get through that process. And that doesn't necessarily make them, I'm sorry, a good interviewee. It doesn't necessarily make them a great employee. So half the time it is a crapshoot and you have to get them out in the field working with your staff and in your meetings and seeing if they fit. That's why for us, it, re it takes a year for us to really know if somebody fits. When a, when a recruiting agency says to me, um, you know, after three months, if, uh, uh, if they don't work, don't worry, guaranteed, we can get you somebody else uh, for the price you paid. I go, no, I need, I need a year. Nobody agrees to a year. So we end up on six months. And within that first six months, it's really hard for us to see if that person actually does fit because they're still in the Goldilocks stage. And, you know, you'd like to think that they're out of that Goldilocks stage after a month or two, but it's, it's really not, especially when you're getting into the higher level people like project managers. You know, project managers and general contractors, they know how to sell themselves. They're salesmen. That, that's, that's part of the job. It's how they've gotten to where they are. They, they're salesmen. So I, I recognize that when I'm interviewing them. Um, but, you know, I just, I, I ask a lot of questions about their family uh, because that's important to us. And um, if a lot of background questions, probably less about the work because their resumes already described the work. And then once they get into the work, we have our systems that I'm going to make you follow anyway. I want to hear what you have to say, but we really want you to follow ours and then kind of, bring yours in to add to it uh, after we've gone through a group discussion on it and decide that we all together want to add to it. But I'm, I'm not necessarily looking for that person to come in who's got the most experience in the world and the best or thinks he's the best because we kind of run our company a little different to most, uh, at least for small residential construction companies. I feel like we run it more like a big commercial company. Um, so it's hard for residential guys to, it's not hard. They don't, it's not necessarily where they come from. So what do I do when I'm hiring them? I'm, there's a lot of gut feel. I gotta, I gotta like that person, the actual person and see if they can be taught. And then we try and teach them. But if they are, it's all me. I know what I'm doing. Not in, you know, you don't need to tell me a single thing. I probably won't hire them. <laughs> I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I probably won't hire them because I know that we do things a little different to most construction companies. Yeah. And just riffing on what you said a bit, cause I know I, I work with a range of GCs, right? Some people, when I start working with them, they are have a robust hiring and recruitment process. Other people, when I work with them, in many cases, actually, they have areas where they can improve in at least one area or maybe a few areas of their recruiting process. And so just some takeaways from what you said. I mean, first of all, I've, a lot of it sometimes does come back to gut feel in recruiting as part of what we do. I like to refer to recruiting as a science blended with an art. It's, it's a little bit of both, right? Like there's the science of, you know, how you conduct very structured interviews, how you ask certain questions in certain cadences to help people give, help get a fair shot of people and not be biased in the interview process. And there's also the art of human communication and dealing with individual people. And so this all plays into it. But at the end of the day, you brought up a point earlier, which is actually interesting. And it's something that big league as, as an agency work to differentiate ourselves on is going away from more of that contingent type, re type recruiting model in many cases and going more toward a shared risk model where we have more commitment working with our clients so we can know more about your business. We can be a real partner for you. Like we can be really an extension of your internal team so that when we represent right. candidates yeah. to you, we can have a really good feel for your story and what makes a good fit, what doesn't make a good fit. And we can consistently give you that push 
that allows us to give that year long replacement guarantee when we're in a committed um, engagement with a client versus like you said, many people who are in our industry wouldn't give that. And that's why, you know, we want to have that level of partnership because we can find better fits and help evaluate the whole process of recruiting. For example, like some people I, I work with, it's interesting. Either they'll have one hour long interview where they ask questions the entire time and the candidate doesn't really have much time to talk. Then they'll have a week or two weeks of feedback period before they decide, yeah, we'll make an offer, right? Like an, uh, two weeks later, we'll make an offer. They've had one hour long meeting. Maybe they did a personality assessment, maybe not. And, and then they're making an offer. On the flip side, I would say that if you were to lengthen out your number of interviews while keeping the same time frame, you could do a such better job as an organization. Get them in the first interview, get to know them. That's typically me, like a screening interview for my clients. But in, in this case, if it's just a company without a recruiter, have an, a screening call, get to know them, build that initial rapport, then have a second meeting, get to know, like, is this going to be a fit? Talk about what you're talking about referencing earlier, get to know each other, but then let's actually not wait two weeks to do the next step if there's interest and we want top performers to keep interested in the role let's bring them on site let's bring them in the office let's see how they react when they're at the job site with a team member in certain situations let's have them meet multiple members of the team before they start so that we can give ourselves the highest level of certainty that they'll be able to fit with different aspects of the organization now this is a people business you can never predict people 100 percent of the time so it can't be perfect but what i found is when you implement little things like this along the way it can really help give your team more certainty around you know um, eliminating your risk of mishire as much as you can and giving yourself the ability to recruit and retain the best people and that level of high touch personal process it might help you find out that they're not the right fit faster too. And that's okay. That's actually the goal um, is, is are they a good fit or are they not? So um, yeah, it's just some, just some feedback for anyone listening to this. I know we already have a master class from Terry today. So I figured I'd, I'd throw some in from personal experience. But... Well, no, I agree with everything you just said, but I agree with all of that. And, and if you, you, you are in a, in a unique position that you can say to your, um, clients this is what i would like you to do before you decide take them into the field have your initial phone conversation have a good one hour meeting to really get to know them and take them into the field and after that if you if you follow these steps before you hire them then i will give you your one year guarantee on that employee for for me that would put you a step above everybody else i would i would Everybody that I hire would be through you with that, with that kind of a, that kind of a guarantee. Uh, that's, that's great. I appreciate the feedback and that's why we do this, right? We take feedback from leaders in the industry all the time who we work with and we speak with, and we're looking to build the most robust partnership oriented hiring process possible. Because as a recruiter, we partner with two people in this. There's no secret. If you want to be an advocate for and, and really drive win-win results, I need to advocate for my clients and advocate for my candidates with full transparency. Because if it's a great fit for you, but not for them, I'm people are going to be unhappy with me. If it's a great fit for them, but not for you, people are going to be unhappy with me. So by really having that advocacy and transparency, I found that it, it really does produce the best win-win results. So feedback, much appreciated, Terry. And then really just going into things as we get to the back end of the show, I'd like to talk about how you see the state of the, the luxury residential construction market in Florida heading into 2024. What are your thoughts on that? I feel like... We are in the, the country, South Florida is different to the rest of the country. So if we want to watch what's going on in the rest of the country, uh, you know, the, the, the country has been struggling the, the last, the last year there was, there was the, um, the, 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 the SaaS industry that's gone down. So there's been a lot less money from these guys who would just be blowing money on construction um, because that industry struggled for 18 months now. There's the commercial, there's the commercial, there's the banking industry that's failing now because commercial, first of all, because you had SaaS industries failing, you had, um, you have uh, COVID made People stay at home, so you had less people in in offices, and now you got the interest rate hikes hikes that have 
interest rate interest rate hikes to uh, to curb inflation that in my opinion went too fast and too high uh, but then again we also during COVID, we should have put two trillion into the market, not six trillion into the market, even though we all gained, but it created where we are today. Um, so the, the problem is the rest of the country has been is struggling. I know construction struggling, people are losing their jobs. I know in commercial job, commercial jobs are just literally coming to a halt. I mean, they're stopping. People are halfway up with buildings. I know one builder is 80 million into the shell and has canceled all window orders, all other future orders, the jobs just come to a stop because um, people aren't moving into these big buildings and banks aren't giving loans for these big buildings because over the next two years, over this past year, banks have been failing the, and, 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 um, and every five years, these commercial loans have to be renewed and they're all about to be renewed at 250% more than what they were. But they're not getting the rents for, and they're not getting the rents because not enough people want your rent. So, and this is going to get accentuated over 2024 and 2025. So that is going to affect residential construction. It is going to put a lot more people in the market for jobs. Um, but the people building the luxury homes are typically the so are typically the high income earners who have been struggling a little because of the, uh, the, the SaaS company prop issues, the uh, stock market has kind of not been doing as great as what it was, but it is right now rallying and it's doing great. But, you know, it's, it's, it's going like this. It's going sideways more than where it was going up the whole time. Um, and those are our clients. You know, our clients are business owners who are affected by these interest rates that have been put in place to curb inflation. Now, the curbing inflation helps the regular folk of the country, which is great that I understand that, but it doesn't help my clients paying for these big expensive homes. It doesn't help me as a developer who needs those kind of clients and needs these big loans. And next year is, we, we expect interest rates to come down a little bit. Um, but a little bit. So will that make uh, a few thing, a few other businesses start to rally? I think so. Um, it's it's so hard to tell. I I just put my head down and do the best that I can at my job, uh, building the houses that I have, trying to find new houses to build for my staff to build. Um, luckily for us, these houses take two or three years to to build. So you can, if you can consolidate what you've got, um, be, uh, cut your burn and you can get through it. And I think that that's what everybody needs to do. They need to cut their burn and get through it. And next year, you know, you just don't know. I think there's going to be a lot of people looking for jobs, but is there enough money in, in the industry still? Is there enough money out there? For the luxury construction market, I think there is. I think there's going to be. Um, I think this property has. It's, it's not going crazy. Things aren't really selling very well right now. Not much is selling. So if it's not selling, well then are people renovating their houses? So for renovators, I think renovation companies are going to do fantastic. This is what happened in the last recession, 2007. The recession started where you couldn't you couldn't buy or sell property anymore. But, and that went from the, from January, 2007, all the way to September, 2008. That's almost two years where my renovation business doubled in sales each year. And I feel that that is where people need to focus. We've shifted our focus to start taking on renovations, uh, three, four months ago. So we are, we're taking on big renovations just as a precaution, luckily for us. We have eight houses underway and three more in planning. So, I mean, we don't really need to do that, but I'm doing it just as a precaution um, in case things get tight. Now, it's, it's so hard. It's so hard to tell. But what I can say, we're lucky in South Florida. We're luckier than the rest of the country. And people const constantly move down here. I know because I own a yacht club that people come to join and they got to go through a strict interview process 
and we're taking on three to five new families a month. Last year it was seven to ten new families a month. The year before was seven to ten new families a month. That was crazy. Now we're down to three to five, whereas a lot of places are getting less people. Um, you know, not people. You think, well, we're in a we're in a bit of a recession here. Why are mm-hmm. people joining our clubs? Well, because they're moving to South Florida, mm-hmm. and people are joining like crazy. We're in we're in the middle of construction, and people are joining like crazy. We don't even have a full yacht club. People are joining, so I get to hear they're coming from New York, Chicago, California, all over the country, moving to South Florida because it's better here than it is everywhere else. So we're we're lucky. We we're probably going to skate through this just fine. But my suggestion is cut your burn, consolidate what you have. Mm-hmm. And just just take it easy. Don't don't pull back. Mm. Just just be careful. Mm. It's a lot of banking. A lot of banks are going to fail next year. Very interesting. And that's well. It seems like you've taken a, an approach of diversification in many ways and moving with the market, if you will, like you talked about earlier. It's just as a, maybe a nugget of thought for some people listening to this. I before I ran big league, I actually had a marketing company that did lead generation and appointment booking for home remodelers, right? So like window and door companies, uh, exterior remodel companies, painters, people like this, where I'd run advertising campaigns on Facebook and on Google and these different platforms that can generate leads with paid ads. And then they, you know, put their information in as a lead. And then we'd send them campaigns to follow up and book appointments with these leads on the calendar for sales reps. And essentially a company eventually got hooked up with me who built it or who was building, just starting a company actually to build ADUs, auxiliary dwelling units. They're basically a back house. There's, they're more legal in some areas than others, but it's interesting, right? Because these could be lick and stick, um, you know, drop them in prefab properties. These could be fully custom luxury properties that people build in the back of their house. And I've heard that actually in a previous recession, when I was talking with a candidate about this the other day during an executive search, something he did to help his building firm was when times got tough, they started building more ADUs and they started marketing to build more of these backhouse properties and they were very profitable. They were easier for homeowners to pallet spending money on because they were less than building a whole brand new house and they could add in some cases, I'm not a legal advisor, but they could add some sort of financial like, you know, um, liquidity to the homeowner's pocket. If you had a renter in the back house, you could rent it out. It could be an Airbnb. It can increase the home value. There were so many reasons that could help homeowners justify this type of investment versus building a whole brand new property. So I ended up helping this company go from pretty much the ground up building their marketing campaigns. And then they started having seven figure months within the first, I think, six months we were working together selling these ADU properties. And it was interesting. They were brand new. They subbed out most of the work and it it ended up growing in success over time. I'm sure they had their learning lessons like everybody else. But point is, it might be an interesting avenue for some GCs to consider or builders to consider is that ADU model if it works in your market and just something I've seen work in the past. So you never know. Find, find some other ways than what you just typically exactly. used to. Exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, getting to, you know, more along the lines of entrepreneurial advice, like you've been sharing, if someone was looking to start their own construction management firm or their own GC that, you know, is building in the residential space is what we're talking about today. So let's be specific. What, what advice would you give to that person who wanted to be where, where you're at someday? Get the experience by working for a good builder, number one. Um, Start young because to build up a construction company to the 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 kind of level where where I am takes years and and I'm not even up where I want to be yet I want to be even higher it takes years years because you have to start you have to start with your hundred thousand you have to then move to your two hundred and move to your four hundred and move to your eight hundred you and those take years to build all those things so start young. Take on whatever you can. Um, As a GC and you're just starting, hire an assistant. I had an assistant since I was uh, 24, uh, 2001. What was that then? I forget how old I was then. Um, Since I started my construction company, I had an assistant. Um, and it started where, because I thought, well, I had another full-time job and, and don't be afraid to have another job at the same time to, to make your money. I had a full-time job and I needed the assistant to do the work while I wasn't there. But what it ended up being is that that assistant 
just helped just helped me so much. And even when I stopped my other full time job, I couldn't live without having that assistant because GCs, especially when you're first starting and you don't have all the systems in place like I have, you're doing everything, everything. You need a low paid assistant who can do those busy work stuff for you so you can do the important stuff. That's that is one of my keys. I've told I've told everybody that just hire an assistant. They go, I can't afford that. I can't afford to pay somebody fifty thousand dollars to be an assistant. Do it. Do it. It will make you it'll make you if you can just at least pay for them. It'll, it'll help you grow your company where you can double, quadruple, whatever they cost you. It's almost like you can't afford not That's, to hire an assistant. Yeah, you, you can't afford not to, not in this business. There's too many little things to do. There's, there's so many government regulations from permitting. There's so many things you need to, need to do on plans and engineering and shop drawings and this, everything. You need somebody to do all that stuff for you while you can focus on on the big stuff. And what would you say were some of the first key things you delegated? And what were some of your learning lessons in that delegation process that allowed you to work well with your assistant? Because I think some contractors think that. It's like, what if I come in and I hire somebody and they don't do a good job? Well, a lot of times doing a good job, if you hired someone at least decent, it comes back to the delegation. So it's like, what do you teach them to do? Yes. And what, what did that really look like? Bookkeeping and permitting. That was the first thing that I, uh, I had them do. Bookkeeping and permitting. I don't want to be sitting at the building department at 7 a.m. waiting in line for them to show up at 8 and say, and then, and then I don't want to do that. I want to be on the job site. I want to be with the client. I want to be getting more work. I want to be doing big stuff. Um, let somebody else go sit at a building department for three hours. Permit expediting. And let that person do permit expediting and, and your bookkeeping. And if I was to guess, you were probably hands-on with the leadership in the beginning. You probably gave them an idea of what greatness looked like, taught them, were there to answer questions. And then, again, just like your whole mantra for training trainers and building this culture of leadership, was it the same for you back then? Were you very concerned with developing, developing them in to be self-sufficient so they could help you save more time ultimately? Yes, yeah, so I remember what I what I said in the beginning where I come from was 17 being a manager and 18, 19 going through major training courses on train the trainer and how to train. And by, by 19, 20, I was teaching owners on how to run these restaurants. So I was very young, exposed to training people and training the trainers how to train people. And that I just put that into everything that I did in life. So it, I was very young hiring assistants and being quite specific on what I need. The same in a much smaller scale, but the same kind of structure that you see that I have today uh, started back. That's actually been one of my biggest learning curves um, in entrepreneurship thus far is replicating leadership through the fold as uh, an executive from BN Builders put it one time to me, is really replicating what success looks like through other people. Because for so long, I was more so used to doing things on my own in, in solopreneur businesses, running a one person marketing shop. Like, and maybe I had a virtual assistant. And actually I think back to it, I was so poor at delegation when I first begun. It was, it was so blind. I was running my own company with little mentorship and just trying to figure things out out and investing in this coach and investing in that coach, I just didn't realize how little I knew and how green I was, which led to really poor delegation. I'm talking like five, six, seven years ago when I first started, it was bad and it's gotten better the more I've intentionally worked on it. It's been a really key piece of focus for me is how can I find number one, the right people to learn from who can help me become a better leader. And then number two, how can I be a better leader for my team and pass my learnings onto the team and these things that, that now I've you know, taken in from great mentors over the years. How can I distill this and pass this on to my team? And how do I need to show up to be the best leader possible to, to make it beyond just me, right? And that's been such a big focus for the last really few years for me is how to be a better leader. And it's such a blessing for anyone, but for, for you, it's a blessing because you were taught this at an early age through these programs and these opportunities that you earn for yourself. Right. Like you call it luck, but I mean, you have to be ready to earn luck and take advantage of these situations. So even if it is luck, you are ready to capitalize on the opportunity. So you can say luck if you want, but you are ready. And so I think just being ready in the time and really everything that has 
transpired over the last few years has forced me to be better and, and realize that there are areas I need to grow. And it's such a fun process, actually, to see what it looks like when you grow as a leader and what that means for other people around you who you're trying to help with them and their lives and their growth. And so it's, it's just such a blessing for you that you're able to experience that. And I think also it's a good takeaway that if you want to grow in your career, intentionally investing in your leadership abilities beyond just being able to get your job done is a very valuable exercise to help provide value to your company. Of course, doing your job at the at going above and beyond is, is should be a standard for a top performer. But then the question goes, what's next? Okay. What goes, what's next beyond my job? How can I help take my leadership yeah. to the next level? And so, you know, it's just such a, a great takeaway from how you've been able to grow. And I'm sure that was helpful going into the delegation to that assistant. I just think about it. It could be a blind spot for some people, or you can come in and just do great and have a, an awesome outcome like you did. Yeah, well, people think it's just another expense that I don't need, I can do that job. Yeah, but you could also do something so much more important than what you've got them doing. Optimizing for the highest profit producing activities, like we talked about, like you've done in your whole business That's, earlier. Yeah. That's, That's it. it. So I guess as we wind down the podcast, would you like to highlight anything coming up on the team or any initiatives or any news you want to spotlight in the market? Yeah, well, keep an eye out on Lighthouse Point Yacht Club and uh, see that see that go up. It's, it's uh, seven years in the making so far and there'll be another three years before construction's finished, two and a half years, um, almost 10 years of my life. But it is... It'll be an absolute jewel of South Florida when completed. Well, cheers. Congratulations, everybody. Terry Patterson, this has been such a phenomenal episode. I think this, we broke a record today for the longest episode of history of the Construction Hall of Fame podcast. So cheers to breaking records today, Terry. No, so much to take away from this, so much valuable insight that you shared with us. So again, thank you for being a guest today. And if you want to find Terry, um, you know, LinkedIn, Terry, T-E-R-R-Y Patterson with one T. So P-A-T-E-R-S-O-N, uh, building some beautiful work in Florida. You'll read all about his awards and his company and everything he's built over the years. So, and not just his construction company, we cannot forget about the Yacht Club either. So uh, again, thank you so much, Terry, for joining me on the show today. So, so Matt, I, I actually don't, uh, I don't do much on my LinkedIn. I don't even, I don't even ever look at it. So better to, uh, uh, better to go to our website at pattersondevelopment.com or uh, Lighthouse Point Yacht Club, lhpyc.com. And, um, and you can see everything we have going on. So folks, ignore the LinkedIn. We're not going to go find Terry on LinkedIn. <laughs> we can go to the website. And I'm sure that if we, we, we'll, and, we'll and, find you. And, and I'm, you know what? And I'm sure that Stephanie has, uh, she has us on Instagram and Facebook and all over the place. Um, you can see Patterson Project Management on all over. Awesome. Well, again. That's, that's what I have the marketing person for, right? Exactly. Great delegation right there. All right. Well, awesome episode. Thanks again. And uh, I'll be looking forward to air this.